Uh, hey everyone, so we're going to be talking today about videos with ExoPlayer, but before we get started, let's get to know each other. Uh, my name is Alexei, I've been working as an Android software engineer for the last seven years. Uh, currently I work at Reddit, uh, mostly working with videos, uh, and I'm also a Google developer expert for Android technology. Uh, to, if you want to connect, uh, you can reach me out on Twitter. Um, I really enjoy having new chats, especially about videos, Gradle, UI testing, and so on. So don't hesitate to do that. And uh, uh, a bit about Reddit. Reddit is a social app. Um, so uh, technically, we have uh, uh, around 700 Gradle modules. So we are 100% on Kotlin. We, we recently started a migration process to a Jetpack Compose. And its adoption currently is 56%. I believe it's actually uh, And uh, to support, to deal with all of that, we have 75 Android engineers. And uh, videos actually are a very, very huge part of Reddit. So we have 10 different surfaces uh, to support. And this talk is primarily going to be about challenges we encountered along the way. Um, we're going to start with uh, a bit of theory. I know it's going to be, you know, this probably could be a bit boring, so but it's actually essential to know. Uh, we're going to discuss what the video is. We're going to discuss frames, codecs, resolution, bitrate, adaptive playback, and of course, Android Media 3. But second part is going to be practical. Uh, we're going to be talking about delivery, about caching, prefetching, load control, buffers, uh, bandwidth mirror. Uh, we're going to improve video resolution. We're going to be talking about decoders and calls, uh, how to deal with all of that stuff with Jetpack and Pose. So we're going to try to squeeze maximum from ExoPlayer today. Uh, but my main goal is actually give you some practical tip, uh, the tips and tricks that you could use on your project. If you have some video stuff, you can make them work better. If you don't have videos yet, you can refer to this talk later and rewatch it. But before we dive in, just uh, uh, some small reminder. Uh, uh, I really want to encourage you to test everything via uh, your own A-B tests, because today I'm going to be showing a lot of different data to you, how different parts in ExoPlayer affected downloading and that kind of thing. So be careful with that, because things that worked pretty well for us may didn't work uh, well for you. Let's start. What is a video? Um, looking on that animation, we can see that video is actually a set of different frames really often being accompanied by audio. And uh, to guarantee that we have uh, actually that motion for a human eye, at least 24 frames per second required. The standard has been used since early days uh, in cinema industry, I think since CLTS. Uh, lately, 30 FPS appeared as a standard for television. Um, and also we have 60 FPS as kind of um, industry standard, minimum industry standard now. Uh, and, it's not even a, uh, and it's not even a limit, by the way, uh, because, uh, for instance, modern Android devices uh, by Google can support even 90 FPS. That means that we have really, really tiny amount of time to draw the frame. But when it comes to video content and everything video related, we still may see that some video services are still drawing videos uh, with a 30 FPS. And there is a reason for that. The reason is because everything about videos and storage, uh, and storage uh, consumption is very expensive. For instance, if you have 1080p video, uh, like uh, with the settings that you can observe right now, the cost of one second uh, could be like 1.2 megabytes. And, and this is 30 FPS. Just imagine if it would have been 60 FPS. And because it is very expensive, um, like uh, this is not how frames are being processed internally under the hood. So it's not like set of images that one followed by other, by another. Uh, so instead, whenever you draw the content, we have very different type of frames. The first frame is called iframe or intro frame. It has 100% of content that is being displayed and it's openly used as a reference point. We also have P-frame, 
uh, which is predictive frame, it stores difference between previous frame, which is an iframe, and uh, the current frame. We see that Pac-Man moved a bit, but dots remained the same position. And there is also one more type of frame that calls bidirectional frame or B frame. It stores difference between previous frame and uh, uh, the next frame. And those kinds of frames are the most efficient. And usually, uh, backend engineers are trying to optimize B frame on encoding service as much as they can to reduce um, uh, to, to reduce downloading time. And while I was learning all of that stuff, uh, I was thinking, OK, who is that very cool guy who is operating those frames and responsible for all of that crazy logic that we're discussing right now? And the guy name actually, Mr. Kodak. Um, so Kodak is short for coder and decoder. It has only one, one main goal. Uh, on the backend side, it compresses uh, the video content to improve delivery from backend side to the client side. And on the client side, we have a special software called Decoder that decompresses that and returns video to, to its original state. There are two types of uh, decoders, like software and hardware. Uh, software decoders support uh, a way more modern formats. Uh, however, hardware one work um, a way faster. Uh, and it's uh, not uh, actually putting any load to CPU, which is very cool. And talking about variety of codecs, oh my god, there are just, just a lot of them. Uh, so we have AVC, VP9, etc., etc. And you can see how different codecs are spread across different production environments uh, nowadays. And uh, you still can see that AVC which is the oldest one, I would say. It's more than 20 years uh, than it's been used. It's still the most popular one, uh, but companies actually tend to move um, uh, towards the most efficient codecs, like VP9 or VP8, for instance, just to reduce um, decoding time. Uh, I would say that if you just started with video, and if video is not like a main part of your Android uh, application, and you are not building a clone of uh, Amazon Prime or Netflix, probably AVC is going to be a very pragmatic choice because it works everywhere. However, even if you would like to choose some modern uh, some modern uh, codecs like VP9, you still would need to have some fallback uh, to AVC because not 100% of Android devices uh, are going to support that, unfortunately. Uh, in video, we also have resolution, quality, and bitrate. What is that? Talking about resolution, um, each frame consists of tiny dots called pixels, right? And uh, that forms resolution. Um, different uh, codecs have their own quality formats, like HD, 4K, and so on. Uh, but talking about bitrate, uh, it actually amounts of information that can be transferred within the amount of time. You can imagine um, a pool that we are trying to, uh, 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 a swimming pool and the water that we are trying uh, to use to fill that pool. And uh, um, talking about delivery of how to deal, how to deliver videos uh, from backend side to the client side, we actually have uh, not a lot of choices. The first way is just to use pure binaries, MP4 videos. It's very easy setup. Uh, because all we need to do is just download file, and that's it. It's supported everywhere. It has only a single round trip to the backend side, though it will be downloaded partially. Um, so, and uh, uh, it, uh, however, it uses single bitrate, which means that it's not adaptive for network. Uh, just imagine you're watching a video for 10 minutes, you downloaded that in a very bad quality because you didn't have very good bandwidth, and uh, quality is not going to adapt for the network. Uh, to address this problem, there is adaptive protocols exist like Dash or H, uh, like Dash and HLS. And uh, they support multiple bit rates. They adapt to network change on the fly magically, which is very cool. However, there is very complex setup. Unfortunately, it actually requires some time from you to make it work on the backend side, especially. 
uh, and it has additional run trips for the backend side. And we're going to review uh, why it's bad. Just in case, talking about Dash, um, how it actually works. Um, it works on Android and web. So it has minimum two round trips. The first round trip, it fetches manifest file that defines uh, a lot of information about segments, about video and audio segments. So it has minimum two round trips to show the first frame. And it doesn't have a native support for an IS, which could be a deal breaker for you. And talking about HLS, that's older protocol that works everywhere, including Android. Exo player do support that. Uh, and it has minimum three round trips, unfortunately. Uh, it has to fetch master manifest first, choose the playlist, and fetch this playlist after that. And only after that, segment going to be fetched. That actually creates a lot of ways to have uh, some playback error. Um, so whenever we want to show a first frame for a video, so we have our Android device, uh, we have our Mr. Backend, and we have CDN where we store video content. Um, first of all, we reach out to the backend side and tell him, hey, please give me some videos to show. Uh, so we show some buffering, then we select, for instance, first video. Uh, we have a lot of URLs. Then uh, we're downloading MPD file with dash. That MPD file actually, or manifest file, it has um, some information about video tracks, required network connection, and that kind of thing. And it also has some information about audio tracks. Um, so once it's downloaded, um, we're going to download audio uh, by selected quality. Uh, by selected bitrate, we're going to research how to, uh, how to do that uh, in upcoming slides. We download the video, and only after that, the first frame is going to be displayed. Um, however, if you would like to upload the video, uh, with adaptive playback, it's going to be even more complicated because from the client side, what do we need to do? So we just need to upload that to the Mr. Backend. Uh, Mr. Backend gonna communicate with some kind of encoding service. Uh, that encoding service gonna update everything to CDN, so it's gonna cut every video to different quality. It's gonna create manifest file, so and then it's gonna be served again to the client side. And to deal with all of that stuff that we have with videos, uh, we have Media Three set of libraries. Uh, and just in case, did you know that there, there are thirty four libraries available for us? Just a lot of them, really. And uh, the good thing, we, are, we already see similar words like VP9, HLS, Dash. That was actually a reason why um, I was talking about that before. So, and uh, let's go to the most interesting part uh, what we can do with Axel Player to get it work better. First of all, if you ask me what uh, like really frustrates me as a, uh, as a user, Number one thing is going to be this guy. Uh, so it's a rebuffering or loading. That's a main motivator for me to leave the video. Second one, uh, uh, that my, uh, 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 that, is that buffering it actually appeared on the most interesting places. That is not very good. But there is things that could be worse than that rebuffering. It network error or something went wrong, guy. So. At that point, I will probably close the application. And of course, I would like to all of the videos be in a very good quality. Th those th three things are going to improve today. The first thing you can start uh, is to think about proper delivery and proper protocols. Historically, I tried it. We used Dash for all of Android video content. And it it turned out that with Dash, you have a lot of requests, a lot of round trips. And those requests are the best friend of something wrong guy and network errors. Um, so, and what we decided to do, we decided just to, con to conduct an experiment and replace uh, some of the videos uh, uh, to just pure MP4. As a result, um, how we started to have 5% less playback errors and video view of this increased. Uh, talking about recommendations, uh, our experiments showed that if you have 
the video content under 45 seconds, like video is not main part of your app and so on, you can just use MP4s, uh, and then it's going to be just fine for your application. However, if you have uh, um, longer video content, like more than 45 seconds, adaptive bitrate, unfortunately, is going to show better results. The next thing um, you, that's actually pretty touching uh, for the video. And the idea behind that is actually easy. Uh, While well, we're watching some videos in our video player, what we can do, we can prefetch the next one. And uh, while I was actually Googling first time how to do that, and what approaches do we have, Exo Player provides just a lot of options to do that, like dash downloader, dash util, HLS, etc., etc., and it's not very clear what to use. But before the prefetching, actually, you need to deal with caching. And uh, uh, how it actually works. Uh, so whenever you want to play the playback, you, you, you need to provide a media source to the player that communicates with data source that could be HTTP data source or, or cache data source. So that data source is going to communicate with simple cache. Uh, so this is an abstraction from as a player that, in my humble opinion, not that simple uh, as it's named. And uh, simple cache communicates with the file system. So all of that stuff we need to provide to the player. But the beautiful part that we can introduce prefetching just from the side. It could be it could live separately in separate module, for instance, and uh, just ha have to provide data source and the same instance of simple cache, and it's going to work. Um, the first question that you may be interested in is where to cache. Uh, on Android, we have two ways. Uh, we could use internal dir that's available everywhere that's isolated from other apps uh, as long as we can tell. Um, so, however, uh, system may clean, uh, uh, may clean up this internal uh, directory. Uh, for instance, if, it, if your application reached certain amount of quota, uh, so operation system going to clean that internal dir for you. To address that, there is an exter uh, external dir that system is not going to clean up unless your application actually stores the content under uh, package name. So it's going to be cleaned up only if application is deleted manually. Um, so however, it, it doesn't have isolation from other apps, and it's not available on 100% of the vendors. And uh, like, uh, uh, I would recommend basically um, to stick with internal cache because it's going to be like pragmatic for most of the cases. Uh, the only way where you need to use like external gear, uh, it's probably if you would like to store very long video contents and to ensure that users could watch that like on a plane, for instance, or somewhere else. Um, talking about simple cache, all you need to do is just to provide that uh, Files that either uh, external dir or internal dir. Uh, then the next thing, uh, I want to encourage you to provide uh, latest to recently used cache. Uh, so that eviction works very well in there, just to, to ensure that you're not going to store like everything. Um, so a lot of libraries follow this approach, like Glide, for instance. Uh, and the database provider adjusts to build an association be between stored files uh, and URLs. Some Linux with simple cache. Um, so whenever you create simple cache, there is no thing in, in documentation mentioned. Is that guy going to hit file system in constructor and you're going to have Android not responding events? So just ensure, just in case, do that on, uh, on the background thread because it may be useful. Um, second one. If you do store, if you do sign your video content uh, in caching, URL actually gonna be used uh, gonna be used uh, as a cache key by default. So if you if your URLs are not stable from launch to launch, ensure that you define that cache key factor to increase the cache hit. And uh, talking about download manager option, I would say like from all of that options that we discussed is the easiest way to implement the prefetching. 
because uh, uh, just in case that the load manager comes from Aga Media Tree library, it's not like our old fashioned download manager. So what it can do, it can pause videos, it can resume videos and remove downloads. Uh, you can work with different requirements. For instance, you can define like download manager, please prefetch if I have good network bandwidth, if my battery is good, if I have enough storage. Um, so, and there are like a lot of ways for trading and parallelization and a lot of ways for experiments. It works very well for uh, all kinds of content like Dash, HLS, and MP4. However, uh, it's not very flexible with adaptive bitrate uh, because uh, we still actually have to do uh, some things manually. Uh, but it could work uh, together with download helper uh, that actually going to help you with, uh, with adaptive uh, content. Uh, so uh, what Download Helper does, it selects proper video and audio track. Uh, so it's going to be paired with Download Manager. However, uh, if you would like to define how much data you would like to download, for instance, like uh, the video, uh, like five, five minutes, you, you don't like to download like the whole stuff. You'd like to download like maybe five seconds or so, you won't be able to do that because there is no API in the load helper for that. There is uh, actually an issue for that uh, created too, but I would say uh, just today, actually I was looking to, uh, to a new media three update, which is on beta, I think, and they introduced a way to fetch the content partially, which is very cool. And uh, talking about prefetching result after we implemented that, with Download Manager, so playback error rate actually the same. However, our time to the first frame and loading time improved, I would say, by 2%. Uh, so 2% of videos started to render within very pragmatic amount of time. That increased overall video view by 1.7%, uh, simply by just introducing prefetching and fetching those videos um, ahead, of, ahead of current playback. Definitely do that. After we implemented prefetching, we started to think, what if we prefetch the next video only if we have very good network connection, very good bandwidth on the device? So we conducted a set of experiments a couple of times uh, with different options, uh, like prefetch only if I have two Mbps, prefetch if I have five, 10, or 15 Mbps. Unfortunately, it doesn't work for us. Uh, so, like, uh, I would say I would recommend to, to not uh, invest time on that because for some, uh, because for some reason uh, the situation becomes even worse uh, in terms of uh, uh, performance and downloading. Don't, don't do that. Talking about future, so we just discussed the basics of protection, and there are a lot of open questions that I haven't tested yet. For instance, would it be better to prefetch on videos but five to se five or, uh, and ten seconds each, and uh, then not prefetch like the whole video? I don't know yet. Potentially, it will be better. Would it be better to download all of that stuff in parallel and prefetch uh, like uh, I don't know even more videos? Uh, that's a question. Or maybe like we should download the segment of one video in parallel. So for instance, hey, the player here is one thread, download me the first and seconds, but in parallel, I'm gonna be downloading the next 20 seconds. So this is an open question as for now. Uh, the next thing that we're gonna discuss is load control. That's, I would say that is the most impactful thing that you could improve an exo player to, give the, to get a result straight away. So what it does, it manages how data gonna be buffering. So, and practically it, it answers, uh, it answers from two questions. The first one, should I continue loading? And uh, if I have enough data, should I start the playback? And uh, as I said, it has a lot of customizations that we can choose. Um, I would actually separate those customizations, customizations into blocking buffering and non-blocking buffering. How it works by default? If you don't touch anything about load control and playing videos with a player, um, player um, 
we'll try to load first two, two and a half seconds, and you, you're going to see buffering on the screen. Once uh, two and a half seconds are loaded, playback is going to be started. And uh, once playback is started, it always going to try to load uh, like uh, an additional content that calls like non-blocking buffering because it's being preloaded uh, as long as uh, playback played. And by default, it's going to preload always 50 seconds. Uh, and those few 50 seconds are going to extend with your playback. Talking about non-blocking buffering, uh, there are two plugs to manage that stuff. Uh, so it's min buffer duration and max buffer duration. Uh, you can see that they are set to the 50 seconds both by default. However, it wasn't the case. The reason behind of setting that to the same values is uh, that basically it guarantees that videos gonna be preloads like always, and it's not gonna depend on user posts and so on. And practically, it was confirmed that it reduces your buffering. So in Exo Player, since uh, two point, I don't remember version, those plugs are by default. So if you use outdated version of Exo Player, please update it just to ensure that those, those values are the same. And uh, talking about blocking buffering that blocks user, there are two plugs for that. The first plug is buffer for playback, um, so which is responsible for the first frame, as we don't. And if user gonna stop playback, like by clicking pause button and so on, and when user clicks uh, play button again, the player will try to uh, preload two and a half seconds, uh, and then after that playback gonna be started. And there is also buffer for playback after buffer, which is, I would say, almost the same. However, it only reacts if we have um, some problem with network and if playback uh, has been interrupted by some external condition. Uh, so in that case, the player is going to wait five seconds. Um, talking about recommendations, uh, what, what did we actually do? Most of our video content are under 45 seconds. And uh, if you have very short video content, what you can do, you can just decrease all of those values, like buffer for play playback uh, to one second, a buffer for, play for playback after a buffer from five seconds to one or two seconds, uh, min buffer and max buffer from 50 seconds up to 20 or 30 seconds. 20, uh, 20 seconds, that's uh, the thing we use at Reddit that worked very well for us. Uh, but just in case, keep min buffer and max buffer equal to reduce rebuffering. Uh, and uh, to make it work, basically, there is a flag that calls set prioritize uh, time over threshold. So also make sure to uh, set it to true because by default, it's false. Talking about results, um, so load time for um, 500 milliseconds increased by 4%. Load time, uh, I would say less than last one seconds. I think I actually, yeah, uh, that was a bit mistaken uh, in this part, within this slide. Oh, sorry. But yeah, load more than, last, uh, more than one second decreased by 11% load more than two seconds decreased by 17%. Video view increased by 1.5%. And that's all only, I would say, by, ch by changing different patterns in Exo Player. So this is, I would say, so far, this is the most impactful thing that you could do uh, to get very fast results. Definitely do that. It's snack. Um, talking about the code implementation, so. Basically, we just need to create default. Uh, we just need to create custom load control, set all of that information, and pass it to Exo Player, and that's it. The next thing is bandwidth mirror. What is that? So uh, it's responsible for calculating network bandwidth that we use um, to define uh, that we use for adaptive bitrate. By default, how does it work? It actually collects a lot of calculations and it uses media on like P50 
um, so for the upcoming playbacks. Let's come back to our scheme. Uh, whenever we download dash playback or HLS, doesn't matter. Um, so before we start download uh, segments, we're gonna call, hey, bug with me, please give me current betray, give me betray that I would need to select. So then uh, based on that betray, it's gonna be selected. Uh, so it will start uh, downloading them, we'll show the video. And once uh, we finish downloading, we're gonna actually update estimated bitrate and we're gonna reuse it for our upcoming videos. And it turned out that, so we were talking about prefetching, right? Uh, so the prefetching is not gonna contribute at all to the bandwidth that may affect video content quality for adaptive, uh, for adaptive bitrate that may be not very good. And the fix actually in download manager, what you could do simply by one line, you can let the data source know that, hey, data source, please contribute to the bandwidth uh, just by one line of code. I'm talking about results. The resolution, the content quality is going to improve. Uh, so I tried it to improve by 1.25% which also affected video view uh, that improved by 0.5% um, uh, too. Definitely do that, uh, especially uh, if you mix uh, MP4 content with adaptive content like Dash and HLS. Uh, while I was learning all of that, I also was interested in like, uh, okay, but what initial betrayed do we have? Because bandwidth mirror is gonna calculate things only after first downloading. But what if we would like to show the first video very fast? So by default, in bandwidth mirror, default values are hard-coded. And for each country, they are different. Um, so based on like averages, for instance, uh, for Great Britain, 4G, uh, it's slower than 3G for some reasons. I'm not sure if it was intentional or not. Uh, but this is how it works by default. Uh, but the real, actually, values are way better. So, for instance, uh, on, on production environment is from 30 to 50 Mbps, at least. It's medium. Uh, but the good thing, you can actually affect and change this behavior uh, by introducing your own bandwidth mirror. All you can do, all you need to do is just to set initial bitrate estimate value, uh, and uh, you just need to pass that bandwidth mirror to the player. Um, I would say there are a lot of ideas of how to use that because it really depends on outcome. For instance, should you decrease initial bitrate for a lower value and to ensure that video is going to be displayed faster but a bit with a bad quality? Um, or you should use latest known bitrate per network type. For instance, you can save latest one, and whenever you start the application, you can check like, hey, share preference or whatever you use, please give me a latest available bitrate for 4G. And uh, uh, you also can consider using it like with some threshold. So I don't know an answer yet because I haven't experimented with this. Uh, but this is something that I probably would do. And there is also experimental bandwidth mirror available in Media One um, Zero One. And the goal is to improve the bitrate calculation because all the bandwidth mirror is not very precise. You can set it actually explicitly. Uh, eventually, though, it will be available and it will be uh, work as a replacement for current bandwidth mirror. So. Yeah, uh, just look for an update. The next thing is improving MP4 resolution. For instance, uh, you have only short video content. You are only using MP4s. What you can do to improve that? Um, so just in case, how it works with Dash, let's come back to our favorite scheme. We do have basically a lot of, uh, a lot of requests like MPD, audio, and video. What we can do, we can 
requests all of that information with URLs and so on, whenever we request an uh, initial video batch, we can use like, hey, please give me everything. Give me like 1080p URL, 720p URL, and information about the required bitrate for the particular URL. Uh, you can throw away all of those requests. You don't need them. And whenever it's time to play the video, you, you, you can get the latest bitrate from bandwidth mirror. Um, you can write a simple logic where you can use the bitrate info that you got from your backend site, and you can select proper video URL, and you can play it, like 1080p, for instance. Sounds very cool, right? And uh, um, like uh, the main difference uh, between this approach and using Dash, for instance, that doing that like from the box, is we're gonna have less chance to have network error and we're not gonna have bitrate change within the playback because for the short video content, maybe we don't need this at all. We also decided to experiment that with Reddit and uh, uh, resolution is improved by almost 10%, which is very good. However, load time dramatically decreased um, so that's why we didn't decided to we didn't decide to proceed with this. But there is something you could do. Uh, so don't use those precise values uh, for matching the bitrate. Uh, instead, actually try to use the bitrate threshold. For instance, you have a network bandwidth like uh, twenty Mbps, or oh, sorry, like five Mbps, but the video requires also four Mbps. Ensure to use that with some threshold, like five plus two or three or four or whatever, because it's gonna work better. So hopefully I'm gonna be able to share some results of this experiment soon. What else actually you can do uh, to improve the video bitrate and so on? Uh, zero flux, if you use dash content, uh, like a mean duration for quality increase and mean duration for quality decrease, you can set it up because by default, 10 seconds for quality increase seems to be pretty long. Uh, so especially if you don't have the content like uh, for 10 minutes or so, uh, and mean duration for quality decrease also could be decreased from my opinion. The next thing is decoders. Let's, let's come back to us here. Um, before, after we download anything or everything and before showing the first frame, there is a decoding process that's going on. And only after the decoding process is finished, the first frame is gonna be available. And the problem is that hardware decoder might not be available everywhere. And if it's not available on your device, like it's requested by external application because, because each device has limited availability of decoders, you're gonna have a playback here, uh, 4001. Um, so, and uh, to address that, the easiest way to enable a fallback in renders factory and pass it to the player. All you need to do is just to set enable decoding fallback as enabled, and that's it. Um, so, it's not gonna work well though, because it's gonna use software decoders that are less efficient. Uh, however, it's a way better rather than not playing video at all, especially on some vendors. Uh, we experimented with this flag and we reduced almost 200 playback errors daily. Um, so that could be a very good outcome. Uh, the, the another thing that you could do, um, you could use uh, basically handle audio focus features that's available in, in Exemplar since recently. Uh, you, you just need to ask, like, hey, please uh, request audio focus from the system. This way, uh, how it's gonna work, whenever you play the video, uh, external playback gonna be stopped. So, and that potentially it means that decoder gonna be available. So try to experiment with this too. Uh, the last thing on my agenda is UI. And, uh, Basically, we have the question, like, where can we render? And we have only two choices, actually. Or do we use texture view that supports a lot of animations that behaves as a like simple Android view? 
Uh, however, it has very bad performance. It consumes battery and it doesn't support DRM. If you work with this kind of content, uh, there is also Surface here that's very good in terms of performance, DRM support. Uh, it's more accurate in frame timing. However, it's very complex uh, because it doesn't behave as a regular view and it has some restriction. For instance, animations in API. Uh, so animations started to work fine only from 24 uh, plus API. The main difference between surface view and the texture view is that so surface view is going to be dis uh, going to be displayed in a separated window. Usually your application has a window to render the content and that content on the background is always getting synchronized with GPU. That's how texture view works. And for regular views and so on, it's fine. But for videos, when we where we change in a lot of frames, that may be very, very, very bad in terms of performance. Surface view, though, uh, has an opportunity to draw directly to GPU. So that's why it's actually it's way efficient. I would say that if you are to introduce, uh, if you are about to introduce video to your app, try to work with Surface View first. Uh, it's going to work for most of, these, of the use cases, and only if it doesn't cover your needs. For instance, you have animations and you have to support API 24 minus. Only, uh, but only that could be a reason to using some texture view. Of course, Jetpack Compose our favorite part. And uh, I would say currently we don't have anything to like, there is no compatible function like video view available for us that, that we can utilize with ExoPlayer together. Um, so we still would need to create to wrap it via with Android U. Um, so, however, if you do that uh, and if videos are part of your scrolling list, for instance, uh, like part of feed, just ensure that you get to use benefits of view pool. Uh, it's like, a, I would say, uh, it works like the same way as with Recycle View. How it's going to work? It's going to ensure that we're not going to have a lot of inflation during scrolling. Uh, talking about view pool results, which is available from Jetpack Compose 1.4 or 1.5, uh, we reduced junky frames so it takes time on videos because we're not reinflating videos constantly. Uh, however, also implement your own controls. If you use default controls uh, that are not in Jetpack and Post, you're going to have that inflation in scrolling. Your, your, your scrolling is still going to be laggy with this inflation. Um, however, with Jetpack and Post 1.6, there is a wrapper appeared for a surface view that you can utilize and use together with ExoPlayer. It's our taste probably experimental and uh, um, you still need to do a lot of things manually. Uh, and uh, it's totally under the hood. It still uses surface here because it's very hard to actually to rewrite it from scratch to Jetpack and post. I would say you're going to have that wrapper uh, for the surface view for a lot of time. Talking about other things uh, that we were not able to cover during today's presentation, when it comes to work with video, unfortunately, there are like a lot of data that you need to process. And uh, I really want to encourage you to work with analytics first. Some of the essential metrics that you would need is time to the first frame, it's rebuffering, playback years, and watch time. Only by having this data in production, you may certainly say, that, OK, Playback in all regions are doing at least fine, and you're gonna detect issues uh, and detect how your improvements that we discussed is gonna affect your production. Um, ideally, try to use single exemplar instance to reuse decoders because it's very hard to synchronize multiple instances. Though in single instance, still uh, like a lot of questions because you have to operate. Uh, the thumbnail, you, you have to set the last frame for the videos yourself and so on. That may be not very, very convenient. Um, so there are also some links that uh, you can read. And uh, 
Thank you so much. If you have any questions, we'll be happy to discuss them. All right, thank you, Alex. Uh, that uh, talk had a great coverage of some basic concepts, uh, some very specific technical information that was useful, and some great memes. So thank you, a very polished presentation. Yeah, thanks. So I don't see any uh, questions in the chat. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a really short break, and then we will jump straight into the next talk. So thank you so much, Alex. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Bye. Take care.